wonderful person, this is Anton, and it looks like we're back to debating Pluto yet again. The uh, two camps of Pluto is a planet and Pluto is not a planet are at it one more time. And there's actually been quite a lot of new uh, media buzz and I guess articles posted about because the people involved here are both scientists and they're both quite prominent. And the people involved in the debate are... As always, Mike Brown, who is basically the principal reason why Pluto has become known as a dwarf planet, not a planet. And he's also uh, a pretty well-known uh, professor from Caltech who's discovered several objects um, in our solar system. And uh, he is obviously saying that Pluto is not a planet. And then we have Dr. Phil Metzer, and I think I mispronounced his name. Um, but he is a uh, yet another professor from Florida. And he also uh, is a former NASA employee working for Swampworks, I believe. Um, and anyway, so he says that Pluto is most likely a planet. And he used a sort of a historical analysis of how the word planet was actually used interchangeably. And basically everybody called Pluto a planet back in the days. And they also called uh, even Sun a planet. So he basically says that, you know, naming it a dwarf planet doesn't really make a big difference. Uh, but here's a kicker, though. I actually wanted to talk about the reasons why um, this beautiful object actually lost its planetary status, and really the only reason. And today I wanted to use Universe Sandbox to kind of demonstrate to you why the scientists like uh, Mike Brown believe that Pluto is not a planet, but basically it's a dwarf planet. But before we start, I personally don't care, and I think most people really don't care. Uh, obviously there's some kind of nostalgia and memories involved with Pluto, you know, we all learned that Pluto used to be a planet, um, or at least when I was in school, Pluto was a planet. Um, and to me, it's just semantics. It's it's not even a big deal. But nevertheless, I want to explain to you the reasons. And so the um, way we're going to explain this is by looking at our solar system right here in Universe Sandbox Square. Now, um, you may already know that, you know, to be a planet, like, for example, we obviously know that Jupiter is a planet, uh, you have to be spherical. And this is um, something that we call, um, okay, this is a little bit better, uh, something we call hydrostatic equilibrium. It's basically when an object that's massive enough become spherical. Uh, many objects are spherical, um, even under a certain mass, uh, but I think the best example of where we kind of draw a line at being spherical is, or are, uh, two objects in the asteroid belt. Ceres, which is right here, is spherical. And it's actually spherical because it does contain a lot of liquid on the inside, a lot of water, which uh, gives it an easier way of becoming spherical because um, it basically is a little bit more elastic, a little bit less dense as well, and so it can actually form um, spherical objects a lot quicker. On the other hand, we have Vesta, which we're actually going to take a look at uh, here in Space Engine because it looks more realistic. Um, Vesta kind of looks like this. It's, um, it's less massive than Ceres, but it is large enough but because it's also very rocky, it's basically a very large asteroid, it's not spherical. It looks more like an asteroid than it does like a sphere. So that's obviously one of the re uh, ways you can become or can be a planet, according to the official definition. The other, of course, is that you have to orbit the sun. Many things orbit the sun, so that's not a problem. But here is where it becomes different. The third reason is that you have to actually be gravitationally dominant. In other words, you have to, what's known as clear the, and I'm using the quotation marks here because it's kind of hard to define this, but you have to clear the orbit of other objects. In other words, you have to be massive enough to be able to clear the orbital region pretty easily. Now, if you look at orbit of Pluto, which I'm going to try to enable by pressing this, you'll see that, well, there doesn't seem to be anything in its orbit. So like, what's the problem, right? It seems to be alone here. Obviously it has its moons, but those don't count. Um, so why is it not a planet then? There's really nothing within like one AU. I guess maybe this object, but that's still pretty far. This is a big distance. Um, and the answer to that is that orbits don't necessarily have to be in the same sort of like region. They, they just have to have similar uh, parameters. And to basically make this a little bit more visual, I'm going to point at another object I've discussed in one of the previous videos which is unofficially known as anti-Pluto. And I'm trying to find it here, but it it's, should be on the other side. There, there it is, Orcus. Orcus has a very similar orbit to Pluto in terms of parameters. Um, and more specifically, it actually has exactly the same um, resonance with Neptune as Pluto. 
In other words, Neptune right here actually controls the orbit of Pluto and Orcus because it's very massive and it can actually do that. Um, so the resonance between Pluto, Neptune, and Neptune Orcus is um, two to three. In other words, for every two orbits of Neptune, Pluto does three orbits, Orcus does three orbits. And um, several other objects in, in similar sort of region of space are also influenced by Neptune. And they have a relatively similar um, parameters in, ter in terms of orbit as well. Here's actually the Wikipedia page for um, these objects. And as you can see, the primary one is Pluto, discovered in 1930, and its mass is the highest in this uh, region. And then we have Orcus here. We have a few other objects with funny names. We have Ixion. Um, and for the most part, their mass is actually much lower than Pluto. And also their orbits are relatively... I guess dissimilar they're not as similar as they are if you were to just look at them visually but they do share very common um parameters they all are influenced by neptune they all kind of have relatively same region of space and so in that sense you can call these objects as having the same orbit and it's really this reason alone uh, that basically disqualified pluto from being a planet because there are other objects here that are in the same orbital parameter as Pluto um, that Pluto didn't really become gravitationally dominant over. Now, in the next video, I'm actually going to explain something else related to this and why I kind of disagree with this. Um, but in this video, I wanted to show you something. I'm going to scroll this to the right here and also give you the major reason why basically Mike Brown is so against Pluto being a planet. It's actually because, okay, I'm having trouble zooming out here. Here we go. It's because he actually discovered a lot of these objects. Uh, a lot of these objects uh, are kind of his career. Um, he based most of his life, most of his studies on uh, essentially, well, kind of showing that these objects are not planets and that according to him, dwarf planets. He defined this term and he kind of unofficially explained it away and uh, proved it. Now, not everybody agrees with him. Actually, as a matter of fact, uh, the, the recent polls indicate, I'm sound, I sound like a politician now, the recent polls indicate that the majority of people believe that Pluto should now be requalified as a planet, again, because they don't believe in his reasoning. Um, but that is the main reason why a lot of scientists, I'm not going to say most scientists, I'm going to say a lot of scientists, believe that Pluto is a dwarf planet. It's not a planet, it doesn't qualify to be a planet, because... Um, there are other objects that share its parameters and that are also influenced by Neptune and are kind of in the same region, but not exactly in its actual physical orbit. They do have similar orbital parameters. And I think the biggest one here is, of course, Orcus. So these two objects have very similar parameters. So it's kind of hard to make this one a planet and then not make this one a planet. And so for this reason, uh, we're going to keep it at that. We're going to basically end this part with this particular analysis, but also uh, let me show you some of the other bigger, uh, just so you can see what they look like, because a lot of them are actually in Universe Inbox. And here I decided to place just five. Um, you might not see the fifth one because it's really tiny, but basically this is kind of what um, they look like. So we have Pluto here, we have Ixion, 2003 AZ84 and Orcus, and lastly this one here. And this is just one of many members of the plutonoid family. The reason I put this object here is because this is actually the second ever plutonoid to be discovered back in 1993, right after Pluto. And then we discovered the larger ones. Um, and so there's at least 350 we discovered as of 2018. There's new ones being discovered pretty much on like, I would say monthly basis. Um, and we believe there is like a million of them approximately, more or less. Uh, making Pluto uh, just a member of the family with similar orbital parameters. But nevertheless, as you can see, it is dramatically more massive and dramatically larger. So in the next video, we're actually going to do a little experiment with Pluto and other Plutonoids to maybe finally answer the question. So is it a planet, maybe? At least according to the science. Anyway, thank you for watching. Come back tomorrow to watch something else that you may have not expected to learn and most importantly subscribe if you still haven't click that bell button to be notified about new videos and um maybe even consider supporting this channel on patreon because it does help me a lot also in the comments below so what do you think planet not a planet or don't care let me know in the comments below thank you for watching and i'll see you guys tomorrow space out and as always bye bye